In beginning and one ending there, high school, elementary, high school area. Congratulations, both of you. The AV guy has finally got the uh, reunion video okay. ready. Can we show that? You bet. Okay. <laughs> Well, we got a we got a commercial first. <laughs> How to escape the heat? That's if you don't the have exercise an air conditioner. class at reunion. So we love the internet. <laughs> Tired of hot and How stuffy to keep rooms cool during in summer. Your this genius way of cool any room in ninety seconds for almost mm -hmm. zero cost is taking. And you said registration opens tomorrow, is that correct? Okay, wonderful. Are there any more concerns or joys? Let's go ahead and pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we know that when we lift our voices to you that you hear us and we are so thankful to have that knowledge and that comfort. You've heard the names that were brought before us this morning. And we pray that your comforting spirit might be with them and to bless them according to your will and their needs. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. One of the scriptures uh, suggested for this morning was from Psalms 47. It calls us to do something. And I, I so enjoyed last week with throwing that ball of yarn around that we were all connected. But it also made me aware as I followed that yarn who all was here to worship together. So I want you to take a moment and look around and see who is here worshiping with you this morning. Because every Sunday it's different. And particularly in the summer, that's the first thing I noticed when we moved here. Every Sunday was different. Always new people popping in. But our scripture then, Psalms 47, it says, come everyone and clap for joy. There you go, and clap for joy. Shout triumphant praises to the Lord, for the Lord, the God above all gods, is awesome beyond words. He is the great King of all the earth. As we continue in our joyful service today, let's stand and sing, now sing to our God, 108. Thank you.
God Almighty, as we come together to worship you, we pray that in this service, in our worship, in our thoughts, in our talking, that it might honor and bring glory to your name. We thank you, Father, for being with us and amongst us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm not Chris Dixon, sorry. That's okay. This is a season of planting and growth. Fields are being planted and seeds will grow into a bountiful harvest. In gardens and flower beds, flowers are growing and blooming. Now is a good time to pray for peace for all creation. Creating God, when your great love pours out in creation, the result is beauty and detail. From the far reaches of space to the DNA and microscopic cells, we are compelled to praise you and sing great and marvelous are thy works. At the same time, we see that your loving creation is being harmed. Animal and plant species are growing extinct. Water is being fouled. It seems like war has been declared on creation. This morning, we pray for peace in all creation. We pray that forces that destroy can be turned toward preservation. Increase and extend our love for all created things. Help us see and preserve your world in all its beauty and wonder. Amen. Well, I'll leave the microphone, but I want to talk to you for just a little bit. Because you all remember I'm different. I'm not Melissa. And that wasn't Chris Dixon. So. And I am so appreciative of your So it's just a wonderful thing that um, God offers this opportunity for spontaneity because I had a wonderful experience yesterday and I was wondering how I was going to share it. And I wanted to share it before I forgot it. And then Melissa calls in sick and says, hey, children's moment. Okay, I can do the children's moment, but first of all, I'm going to give you a test as adults and kids because I've got to share my testimony of what happened yesterday. So you tell me what the mission prayer has to do with all of this. Um, a great big spice jar, a peace award from the World Church, and an ice cream bucket. Ready? Got any good guesses? Sorry, beep. <laughs> How about <laughs> the 3G food pantry, uh, the Catholic Worker House, and the Community Peace Network? Big Spice Jar, Peace Award, Ice Cream Bucket. Got it? Beep. Okay, now put these three people into the mix. Julie Brown, Erica McCroskey, and Tammy and Bob. What do they all have to do together? So in the next three minutes, I'm gonna try and tell you. I was at the 3G pantry, cross that one off. Tammy and Bob, cross that one off. They happen to have a big spice jar, cross that one off. I said, who's ever gonna take a great big, I mean, it's chili powder and it's restaurant size. Who's gonna use that? And I thought, ah, Catholic Worker House always needs food and spices and they cook for 50 people three or four times a week. Cross that one off. Cross off Erica McCroskey too, because she's the person who connected me to the Catholic Worker House. Now, peace awards. So I go to the Catholic Worker House. Oh, Tammy and Bob also had fresh fruits and vegetables that were just gonna go to waste. So I said, oh, Catholic Worker House, but I better stop there now. That was the prompting to start now, stop now on my way home. Okay, so I get there and I say, hi, I'm Erica McCroskey's friend and I've got chili pepper for powder for you and I've got fresh vegetables. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. How do you know, Erica? I said, we go to the same church. She says, what church is that? I say, the community of Christ. She says, oh no. And I'm going, oh dear. <laughs> she, Julie Brown, cross that name off, happens to be a, a top person in the Community Peace Network group. Network, is that the right word? 
trainers here in Des Moines. And she was, she says, I was just down in independence receiving a peace award from that church. And I'm going, I was in the audience as you were receiving that peace award. And we both got kind of this doodly doodly. And I'm going, that mission prayer works and I hadn't even prayed it. Where will your spirit lead me today? So we got to talking and that brings back, comes to the ice cream bucket. They need ice cream buckets at the Catholic worker house. They need cottage cheese cartons with lids. If you get the um, big margarine tubs, anything bigger than a yogurt container, because they have people who come to be fed, but are too shy, too introverted, too special to sit and eat in community. And the only way that they can be fed is if they have a takeout container. And a takeout container can be an ice cream bucket. It can be a mayonnaise jar, not jars, but anything plastic with a lid that can be disposed. So Dale, guess what my next grow project's gonna be? Start bringing in your plastic lidded containers. And you remember, Jean, all those wonderful bags we we're saving that you're no longer cutting up? They'll take those too because they have to have a bag to carry their containers with. And I said, if nothing else, my congregation can handle that. We can get involved with sharing your ministry. But then I had been gifted with some sheets from a friend who said, who, long story, long story, they're king size sheets I had nobody to give them to. So I offhand said to Julie, you don't know, you don't use king size sheets here. She said, would you believe I just bought a king size bed and we have no sheets? That's when things got really weird for me. <laughs> and I said, hallelujah, we're gonna collect ice cream buckets or any kind of buckets. So bring them in and keep bringing in those plastic bags too. And what a wonderful connection from the 3G Pantry's generosity to Erica McCroskey uh, opening my eyes to the Catholic Worker House and then having those people who were right there at the temple <laughs> saying hello to me in, in a strange place. But right now I have to stop being Chris with that testimony and start being <laughs> Melissa with the children's focus. So the children can come up and I'd, I'd love to have someone who would hold a um, microphone for me. You're gonna have this. I'm big, I need a big space. Okay, and who do I have holding them? I do. Okay, then you have to sit right here. I want to hold it. Well, she's already got it. Tell you what, you hold it half the time. Is that okay? Okay, I got an ice cream bucket. And we talked about ice cream buckets, ice cream buckets, right? Yeah. Well, inside the ice cream bucket are a bunch of stuff. And I don't like doing all the talking, ha, 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 ha. But so I want to know, what do you see? I see two pens. Two pens, and they do what? They write or draw. What, Palmer, come, Namari, come down here and sit. Namari, come down here and sit so you can see, because I'm going to be showing you stuff. Come down here. Yeah, good job. Yeah, yeah, come on down. So these two are pens, and they could both write, and they could both draw, but what's different about them? They're different colors. So if I wanted to draw a tree, which one would I pick? Green, Green. unless I was on Mars or someplace. Very strange. Okay, so we have things that are alike, do the same job, but they're different, right? They're different. So now, if I had... These two spices, what do you think? What do we do with spices? We make our dinner spicy. Yes, we make our dinner spicy. And are these the same? Yes. yes. No? How do you know? 
They could be the different kind of spices, but Marari, how are they the same? They're the same color, they're the same size. Okay, who can read? Okay. Okay, what does the big word right there say? Mm, seed. Mustard, mustard seed. seed, and this is dill seed. Would you rather put mustard seed on your pickles or dill? You would put dill. So they come in the same package, but they do different things. How could we figure out that they do different things? Taste, we would have to open them up and taste them. Absolutely. So based on that premise, crackers, no, 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 no. Ah. Are they gonna be the same or are they gonna be different? They're not the same color. So just like this could be dill and this could be mustard. But let's look again. Who can read? Me. What are they? Uh, they're both they're both black pepper. So but they're in different packages. So Chris is going to talk to us about how we know things. Sometimes we guess because they're in different packages, but they might be the same thing. Sometimes they're the same package, but they're different. And sometimes it's pretty obvious, wherever my green one was, that they're going to have a different purpose. So sometimes, like, I can know Amari, and I can know his name, but do I really know who he is? So Amari, let's see how much I know about you. Are you in fifth grade? Do you have four brothers? Uh, do you have a mom and a dog and a cat and a parakeet at all? A dog and a mom, okay. So how well do I know Amari? Not very well, but I know his name. So does that count? Yeah, yeah. yeah kind of. Do you know the name of Jesus? Do you know all everything about him? Uh, no. no, because we've got a lot of learning to do. Even me, I'm 70 and some, and I had still got a lot of learning to do. But does Jesus come in the same package for everybody? Nope. No. Does he come in the same spicy? Nope. No. And at any particular time when we know Jesus, sometimes he's big and he's strong and he's helpful. And sometimes he's just a gentle little caress that says, you're doing a good job. So knowing Jesus, like knowing spices and stuff like that, you kind of have to read about him. And so where do we read about him? In the Bible book and in other books about the Bible. And where can we experience him? Like if we put out all these spices and we just tasted them, where can we taste Jesus? Ooh, where can we taste Jesus? Uh -uh. What do you think? In his body, yeah. Well, when we taste, we sometimes just get a feeling. Like when I was talking about that feeling of meeting these people and saying, they really need our help, I kind of tasted him. He, he, he spoke to me and said, you ought to do this. You ought to help other people. So that's kind of like tasting Jesus, right? So Chris is going to talk to us, the other Chris, about knowing Jesus in our hearts and what we read and what we see and be aware that he comes in all different shapes and sizes, just like the cookies. Animal crackers are all the same, right? Yeah. They're made out of the same stuff, but they have different shapes. Now, I bought these a long time ago, and Willow was in my class, and she knows that that's what we eat for treats. And so if we want to taste Jesus, we could say, I'm going to take a handful of animal crackers, and with every bite I take, I'm going to think about something good about Jesus, okay? And then maybe something good about yourself. Ooh, you got a lot of thinking, don't you? And you know what? When you get some, you can go back to your seat and think about Jesus is, you know, we've got a stuffed Jesus back there. 
And sometimes, oh, I'm sorry, you can't have them? No, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to figure out something that you can have and bring it next time, okay? Can you have them? No. Okay, can you? Okay, how about you, Gaines? Oh, oh yeah. You think about Jesus. Hey, did somebody share a family? Yeah. Okay. Well, now there's a whole bunch left. So if anybody wants to take and share them with anybody in the congregation, Amari, you want to do that? So you can just go in and, and just have everybody taste and feel the love of Jesus as we share, right? Okay. Thank you very much. Now, you didn't get to hold it, right? So you get to take it back to Kurt, who's in the back, okay? And thank you for being here. Thank you, Chris, the other Chris J for um, for leading into that. That was a wonderful way of expressing that. Yeah, we come to know Christ in different ways. Um, and none of us will ever know completely all about Christ, but we each bring um, a certain way of understanding and seeing that can help um, that can help complete that picture for us. So thank you. So at age eight, I was baptized right here behind these these very this very lush uh, garden back here uh, by my grandpa Ward Phillips, and um, I think I've shared with you before that everything but my nose was baptized. Um, and I always wondered if it really took, if because I didn't go all the way under, was it a really legitimate baptism? And then over by the piano, I remember that's where I sat when my sister, Lisa, and my best friend, Terry Morgan, at the time, and I were confirmed. And we had elders, two elders, place their hands on our heads and offer a prayer for us for membership in the church as well as a confirmation of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know if I giggled through the whole prayer, but I know I giggled through enough of the prayer that I remember it. And I always wondered if it took. I know, and we, we can laugh now because we think, well, of course it took. It wasn't the nose that got baptized that made a difference or whether I giggled or not. But I can tell you that um, as an eight-year-old follower of Jesus, um, I really questioned it. I really questioned it. I was more concerned about how it was done than the spirit of what was done. And if I had just asked anyone, they would have said, oh, Chris, you're fine, you're fine. But I didn't even dare ask because I was so embarrassed. So carry that forward to being an adult and a priesthood member. And, and I really, those, that, that came up for me. I needed the affirmation that it took. I needed the affirmation that this wasn't, um, that, that it was real, that my relationship with God and with Jesus, especially Jesus, was real. And I knew about Jesus, you know, as you were talking about where do we learn about Jesus through the Bible, through Bible stories. And I knew a lot of Bible stories, but I didn't know all of them. There were many more that I needed to read and hear and learn and experience. But I reached a point where I didn't want to just know about Christ in my head. Just like, just like uh, Chris, the other Chris J was talking to Amari about knowing who he was, but really not knowing who he was. I wanted to move from knowing about Christ up here and all the stories to knowing Christ here. And I believe Christ must have wanted the same kind of relationship with me because as Chris was sharing earlier, her encounter with having prayed that mission prayer, maybe not that day, but over and over again, and being open to the way the Spirit works, that one thing led to another, led to another, and it was all connected. And so I've had several encounters with Jesus, not because I'm more special than anyone else, because I'm not, but because I asked for them. And I believe that God um, will use anything possible to help us connect and help us get into relationship 
with God because God yearns for us like a mother yearns for a child. Like if you have, if you have an animal that you love so much and you go away and you find yourself just yearning to be with that dog or that cat or that sister or that brother. So God yearns for us in the good times and in the not so good times. And I want to share with you a few experiences that I've had, and I'll bring that into how that ties in with mission. So I grew up baptized, I was ordained, I was even working for the church. And I was in a class that used to have, we called Meads classes, Ministerial Education and Discipleship Series. And it was during a guided meditation in a spiritual formation class down at the temple. And we were invited into this meditation where we were to imagine ourselves arriving in ancient Jerusalem. I'm very visual, so that was easy for me to do, to, to imagine myself arriving in this very hot city. Now, Jerusalem may be cool at times, I don't really know, but on this day, in my mind, it was hot, and it was dry, and it was sandy. And I, in my mind's eye, landed in the midst of this, this square, if you will, this square of land that was surrounded by buildings. And I saw a crowd of men that were gathered together at one side. And it looked similar to this. Dale, there's a slide, if you will, pull up that slide. Didn't look exactly like this, but this was the closest thing I could find. So I walked over and I joined this group at, at the very end of the crowd. And as the crowd of men, I was the only woman that showed up, as a crowd of men jostled and moved their way up through this narrow, alleyway, at a certain point they stopped. I was way in the back, trying to just blend in. And the crowd stopped. And there was a man at the very front of the crowd, because see, it's going up. You can see it's going up. And so he looked a lot taller. And he stopped. And he had brown hair. And he had a robe, dusty robe on. And he turned around. And he looked at all of us. And he spotted me, you know, this, this ashamed little person that never thought that the baptism or the confirmation took. And he said nothing, but he looked me right in the eye. And with his eyes, I knew he said that he saw me and that he welcomed me. And I think he even said, I'm glad you made it. So we kept walking up this, this alley, and I wondered where we were going. But we seemed to be moving with this expectation and trust in whomever this leader was. And when we finally arrived at the top, uh, there was a landing and there was a big pool in front of us, a big square pool of water, and there were columns, uh, porches around it, and there were men laying there waiting for the waters to be stirred. There's a story about that, waiting for the angels to come and stir the water so they could be healed. And one man came and he knelt in front of who turned out to be Jesus. And he asked this, Jesus asked this man what he wanted, and the man said to be healed. And Jesus healed him while we, the rest of us watched. And then Jesus turned directly to me. And he asked me what I wanted. And I remember in my meditation this sense of immediately dropping to my knees. And I said, I want to be healed. And what did Jesus do? He breathed on me. He breathed on me just as he breathed on those disciples in the upper room and said, peace be with you. That Jesus saw before him someone who wondered if they'd ever received that breath of the Holy Spirit, if they'd ever truly been baptized. And in that moment of Jesus breathing on me, of knowing me, I found myself healed. And from that moment on, there was no doubt in my mind that I carry the Holy Spirit just as you carry the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, I was healed of my sense of inadequacy, at least in the terms of being of worth in the eyes of God. So a second experience happened several years later I remember being in Edmonton, Canada. We were having a, a communion service, and the 
the preacher talked about this being the Lord's, this is not the Community of Christ table, or communion table, it's not the Edmonton table, it was the Lord's table. And when we knelt for prayer, my mind took me to a hillside. I stood and there was a big hill in front of me and there was a table in front of me with all kinds of food, all kinds of food. And there were people coming down the hillside with joy and expectation and excitement because they were coming to the table to eat. And I was merely hosting the table. And I may have shared this story with you before. But the people were coming down and they were so different. There were, there were hell's angels that were coming down, you know, bikers covered with tattoos. There were people like you and me. And there were, there were people of other faiths. There were Muslims and there were Jews. And anyway, everyone was coming to the table. It was like a big cocktail party and they were just standing there eating. And I noticed to my right, there was someone standing and I turned and it was Christ. And he acknowledged me. It's always with love. There's never judgment. It's always with love. He acknowledged me and then he began to move behind me and I looked and there was a little stream and a bridge and then some more land and people started moving after him and following him. Not everybody, a lot of people stayed at the table, continued to eat and enjoy the meal. But Jesus crossed the bridge and I followed him and there was no rejection or judgment about anyone, just the acknowledgement that some will follow him and others won't but that all are invited to the table. And another time of prayer, I was on top of a hillside and the hill was covered. Think about that, that hill at Guthrie, you know, as you stand at the um, tabernacle, that's what we used to call it, <laughs> the, the chapel, thank you. And you look down that hill toward the trees. Imagine that hill covered with people who are ill and maimed and their loved ones with them, desperate for them to find healing. And Jesus just stood and kind of waved his hand over him like this and looked at me as if, all right, this is what you're called to do. Called to go and bring healing and move on his, move among them on his behalf. So I don't share these experiences, as I said, because I'm special or closer to God than anyone else here. Certainly not loved any more than anyone here, but I asked specifically to know who Christ was. And he answered my prayers far beyond what I ever expected. The letter to the early disciples of Jesus in Ephesus was written about 50 to 60 years after he had lived and died. And this community of believers received a letter from, we don't know who it was, some say Paul, but offered gratitude and encouragement to this small community. I want to read to you just a, a portion of that scripture that comes from the message. The writer says, when I heard of the solid trust you have in the master Jesus and your outpouring of love to all the followers of Jesus, I couldn't stop thanking God for you. Every time I prayed, I'd think of you and give thanks. But I do more than thank, I ask. I ask the God of our master, Jesus Christ, the God of glory. And this is an important part. I ask to make you intelligent and discerning in knowing him personally, your eyes focused and clear, so that you can see exactly what he is calling you to do and to grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life he has for his followers. Oh, the utter extravagance of his work in us who trust him. Oh, the work he does in us in, by those who trust that our prayers make a difference. So for me, I needed meditative experiences. I needed personal experiences. The stories weren't enough. I needed to meet Jesus Christ in flesh and blood. And I learned that I was to extend welcome and hospitality and invitation to all with real food and with spiritual food. And that I was to find ways to walk among God's people and find ways to bring healing to them and their loved ones. And I was invited to receive the Holy Spirit and invite others to receive that spirit, which would free them and bring them new life. And I am like each of you, his followers, to live out what he laid out in his mission as he stood in the synagogue and read from the scroll of Isaiah. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor and release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to announce the year of the Lord's favor. And it's from those words, Christ's mission statement, that we get our mission initiatives to invite people to Christ, to abolish poverty and end needless suffering, to pursue peace on and for the earth, to develop disciples to serve and to experience congregations in mission. Now, the scripture I read from Ephesians in a different version tells us that this incredible power is in Christ, and I love the way they describe this, who is in charge of running the universe. Everything from galaxies to governments, that no name and no power is exempt from his rule. And not just for the time being, but forever. He, Christ, is in charge of it all, has the final word on everything. And at the center of all this, Christ rules the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts, by which he fills everything with his presence. We, we are the body of Christ. We are the ones who are called to bring his presence to life in the ways in which we live and be and serve and work and speak and pray. We as disciples of all ages have access to the power of Christ through the Holy Spirit whom we're not invited to not just know about, but to know and to embody and to incarnate and to share. So perhaps you're like me, born and raised in the church, knowing about this Jesus, but not really knowing about, not knowing Christ. Maybe Christ has been more a concept than a relationship. As I've shared with you, my relationship or my life experience changed when my pastor of a small congregation in and down in Kansas City said, if you want a personal relationship with Christ, ask for it, pray for it, and it will happen. And a few days later, the first experience did. I'm going to invite us to take just a few moments right now, if you will, to make ourselves available to an encounter with Christ. So if you will, and this involves the children as well, if you will, take several deep breaths. And the reason we take those deep breaths is to bring us into this present moment, not what we're doing after church, not what we've got to do later on, but this very moment. So take several deep breaths, breathing deeply and letting them out slowly. You might close your eyes or lower your gaze if you don't feel comfortable closing your eyes. And continue in those deep breaths as you allow yourself to focus where you are right now and your intention to seek an encounter with Christ. Now I want you to imagine a place where you feel very safe, very loved. It could be outside, it could be in a house, it could be in a church, it could be on a hillside at Guthrie Grove. Just imagine that place right now, if you will. Notice what sounds you hear. Notice the temperature of the air. Is it warm? Is it cool? Is it winter or is it summer? Can you smell flowers or burning leaves or a smell of rain? Just allow yourself to be in that space. Experience it from the heart. Now out of the corner of your eye, as you sit in this beautiful, safe, loving space, out of the corner of your eye, you notice somebody off in the distance that's coming towards you. You don't feel unsafe. You trust this presence that's coming. And as they move toward you, you sense this love and compassion that is emanating from them. 
you look at their face. And you recognize that this is Jesus. He looks you in the eyes and he smiles. And he comes very close. And he tells you something that is meant exactly for you in this moment. Allow yourself to hear what he has to say to you. And notice what it feels like in your body as you hear those words spoken to you by Jesus. When he has said what he needs to say, notice what arises in you, what you need to say to him. At a certain point, he indicates that he needs to leave. He walks away, but you understand that he, that isn't over. That encounter is not over. He's always near, even when you cannot see him. And you are deeply aware that he'll never leave you or abandon you, and that you carry him in your heart just as he carries you in his. So continue your breathing, and when you're ready, open your eyes and allow yourself to just gently return to this space. This is a place of love. This is a place where you are surrounded by others who've taken a similar journey. And this place that you've just went to is a place you can go anytime. And inviting Christ to meet you there is something I believe he would love to do. For he loves you, and he needs you to carry his presence through the world. Knowing about Christ is just the beginning, not the end. Knowing Christ is the work of us as disciples who are, co are committed to co-creating with God a life of joy, hope, love, and peace, not only for ourselves, but for the Catholic Worker House workers and for the folks that come to the 3G pantry, and for you who carries the microphone up to help us, and for all of God's children. As the body of Christ, we are incredibly powerful, but we're not even aware of our God-given power. We know about Jesus, but do we know Christ? We hear the call to mission, but do we really understand what we're called to do? Mahatma Gandhi once said about us, Jesus followers, you Christians look after a document, the Bible, containing enough dynamite to blow all civilizations to pieces, to turn the world upside down and bring peace to a battle-torn planet, but you treat it as though it is nothing more than a piece of literature. The story of Christ is more than literature. It is a life-changing reality that of love and forgiveness that heals us and frees us and invites us and unites us and then pushes us to share this love with all of God's people. In community of Christ terms, as I come to my ending here, we hear these words. It is imperative to understand that when you are truly baptized into Christ, you become part of the new creation. By taking on the life and the mind of Christ, you increasingly view others from a changed perspective. Through the gospel of Christ, a new community of tolerance, reconciliation, unity and diversity, and love is being born as a visible sign of the coming reign of God. So friends, come to know Christ. Come to invite Christ into your heart as Christ seeks to live there. 
see Christ in others. Join in that mission prayer that says, where's your spirit going to lead me? Help me be fully awake and ready to respond. Grant me courage, Holy Spirit, to risk something new and be the blessing of love and peace you've created me to be. May that be so. Amen. Where will your spirit lead today? That's a good one. I wrote this for to do for the offertory. We're going to save it for another day. The spirit is with us today. We've had two examples of how the Spirit's led different people. Now we're going to get a third one. This story takes place a long time ago for some people, back in the 1950s. Camp Donovan, Missouri, youth camp. Final service. Everybody gathers in the tent. That's where they had the gatherings back then. And as we were gathering, a cold snap came in. It got quite cold and nobody was prepared for it. Nobody had coats. We sat there shivering. The service was supposed to be a testimony of how things had gone at camp for each individual, but everybody was too cold. Nobody wanted to stand up and give their testimony. I think the provider finally got two people to stand up, but they didn't give much. Then the guest minister for the camp stood up and had the presider sit down, and he started talking. And as he started talking, a warmth came from the ground. And as it rose, we could feel it on our legs and our bodies. And it came up and it caught above our heads. The whole tent became warm. And as he talked, he talked about individuals, how they had, what had happened to them at camp. And he told other individuals things that they would do after they left camp. The Spirit of God was there. Now we're going to jump ahead to the offertory that was taken at that camp. My buddy and I, when they were getting ready to give the 
cut the thing. We each reached in our pocket and we pulled out a dime. Now a dime doesn't seem much now, but then a dime was pretty good. And so we held our dimes waiting for the basket. But that spirit was still in the room. And I reached farther in my pocket and I found a quarter. And I'm holding this quarter like this, waiting for the basket. And my buddy sat next to me, saw what I had in my hand, and he had a dime. And he reached in his pocket and he found another dime. So he had two dimes to give. So as the basket comes closer and closer and gets there, I still have this dime. And as the basket comes down, I put that dime with the quarter and dropped it in the basket. So there's 35 cents. Now I'll tell you that 35 cents was a lot of money back then. And I had planned on using that 35 cents to go to the canteen after the service. But the spirit was with us. And so I put that 35 cents, last thing I had in my pocket in that basket. Now, if you got an extra 35 cents today, throw it in the basket. It would be appreciated. But will the ushers come forward so we can pray over the offering today? Let us pray. May the financial resource given by those our congregation be blessed that where they may be shed the light of God and the Lord has for all. May our giving bring us joy and happiness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
You are a blessed people. Father, we are humbled standing here in your presence. We thank you for being with us this morning, for touching the hearts of those here, for offering ministry that we each give by just being here, our presence. We give strength to each other by our presence. And we draw strength from you, and we know that all of our strength and all of our joy comes from you, Father. And we are so thankful. And we pray as we leave this place to go into our week that we can take your peace and your joy and your love with us and share it with those that we meet every day. Thank you, Father. And it seems so little to offer up our thanksgiving to you, but we humbly do so. And in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, and love and peace.